written down, that is, engraved or stamped into cuneiform, at least two millennia before the Homeric sagas, the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the great classics of ancient literature. Rediscovered in the late 19th century among the Nineveh Library, written down according to the original, and collated in the palace of Assurbanipal, king of the world, king of Assyria, the Epic of Gilgamesh was the first modern clue to a more ancient Sumerian version of the Great Flood Deluge myth, whose hero king was called Zeusudra, also Utnapishtim, Atrahasis, and in later ages came to be called Noah. From a strictly literary point of view, the Epic of Gilgamesh is as secular as the Odyssey and is contemporary as any heroic tale of an exciting life. Gilgamesh is already in mature manhood when the epic begins, but being semi-divine, that is two-thirds god and one-third human, and vastly superior to other men, he can find no worthy match in love or war. And accordingly, as the fifth king of Uruk, following the great flood, he lords it over his people, to the point where they pray to the gods for relief. They receive it in the form of a natural man, Enkidu, who has been reared by the animals and is enormously strong and swift as a gazelle. Enkidu knows nothing of civilization. He is eventually sought out and seduced by a female, who is either a priestess or harlot, depending on the predilections of your translator. And with his subsequent loss of innocence, Enkidu takes the first step towards becoming civilized. The animals reject him, and he is quickly brought into direct conflict with Gilgamesh. After a knock-down, drag-out fight sequence, the two become the best of bros, and ultimately they set out on great quests, the most notable being their journey into the forest where the giant Humbaba dwells. Unfortunately, the evil Humbaba is the protege of Enlil, and the forest episode is a cruel trap set by Enlil in order to destroy Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Gilgamesh survives, but Enkidu doesn't because it was his hubris in refusing the prayer of Humbaba for mercy. Enlil brings the case before the Anunnaki Council of Gods, and retribution is accordingly doled out. The loss of Enkidu is devastating to Gilgamesh. The loss of their great friendship, and the knowledge that death is inevitable, that Ghislaine Maxwell isn't gonna... I mean, Jeffrey Epstein didn't... <coughs> this knowledge sets Gilgamesh out on a bold undertaking to find everlasting life. His first clue is the legend of the day, which insists that King Zeusudra, who is called Atrahasis, who, remember, is Noah, had not only survived the flood, but had entered into the company of the gods and been taken far away to live at the mouth of the rivers. Gilgamesh's trek, akin to Odysseus's journey, constitutes the last half of the epic, where he encounters a variety of obstacles, including one god's advice that his quest is certain to fail. Gilgamesh also encounters a woman named Siduri, an enigmatic figure living in a place where East and West were confused, and who dispenses the philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry, for this too is the lot of man. Siduri nevertheless provides Gilgamesh with the instructions on how to cross the waters of death, using the boatman Urshanavi to ferry him across in much the same manner as that of the sun's journey into the West each day. An important and notable event occurs during the meeting between Gilgamesh and the ferryman, involving the so-called things of stone, or things of sound, as they are translated, which Gilgamesh rashly breaks, making it then necessary for the ferryman to use punting poles, they are called, which are somehow connected with wings, or winged beings, or figures. This fascinating aside is suggestive of the idea that the things of stone, or things of sound, might have been akin in some manner to the Philosopher's Stone, or O-R-M-E, monoatomic gold, whereby levitation might have been a foregone conclusion as a means of transportation. But without the things of stone, then other means of flying, i.e. wings, apparently became necessary. Gilgamesh's eventual meeting with Ziosudra, who is Noah, begins with more wisdom of the type that man should be content with his lot in life, however short that might be. This is typical advice from immortal or very long-lived beings. But coming from the Anunnaki, who apparently depend upon the starfire 
or monoatomic gold for their longevity, and the humans carrying some of their DNA with them, this advice is considerably more suspect as being bad advice. Ziu Sudra then does an accounting of his experience in the Flood. According to him, the Flood came about after a meeting of the Council of Gods. Any such meeting typically implies bad news for mankind during which Enlil again took the part of the advocate for destroying humankind, because they were too noisy, while apparently his brother Enki was silent, but spoke his mind by aiding Ziusudra separately in surviving the flood. It is noteworthy that the dreadful havoc of the deluge and flood appalled even the gods. Enlil had, apparently, spared no effort to use the horrors of storm, lightning, hailstones, and coals of fire raining down in order to exterminate mankind. And unlike the biblical version, the Sumerian version is based on a group of factious, flustered, and fallible deities. Most importantly, there was no covenant that the gods would not do as much again. But Inanna's explanation that she will not forget these days and the immortality and semi-divine status granted to Ziusudra might be indicative of some respite from anxiety. As a matter of fact, the name Noah means respite. Gilgamesh eventually obtains the plant of youth regained from the bottom of the sea, but inexplicably he does not consume it. Instead, he loses it when a snake eats it, and thereby becomes the symbol for self-renewal. In the end, Gilgamesh has no choice but to return without the secret of eternal life. And even as the king of Uruk, even he must accept the human lot of limited longativity. The epic, with this moral basic to it, might thus be a form of ancient propaganda. But there is also the hint that mankind might have an ace up their sleeve. Perhaps the human lifespan, while enormously brief as compared with the Anunnaki gods and goddesses, might also possess the ability to achieve a great deal in a relatively short time. The creativity of a shortened, but thus highly motivated, lifespan might be enormously greater than that of a god or semi-god resting on their laurels. One additional curiosity is the often overlooked fact that Gilgamesh was two-thirds divine. The ability to achieve a one-third and two-third hybrid is very difficult, if only two parents were involved. But if there were three, then the combination of thirds is plausible. This is very important. Consider one scenario where the combination of a goddess's egg and a human male's sperm, with the fertilized goddess egg then being inserted into another goddess for the nine-month process of going from fetus through childbirth. In this way, the goddess connection is the two-thirds god status, with one human being the remaining one-third. An alternate variation would be a god and goddess achieving a fertilized egg, which is then implanted into a human female for the nine-month process. Which, if you're the birth goddess, this might have a lot more appeal. The key is that the goddess would be the means by which the human embryo is fed, and potentially the human being after birth continues to receive nourishment from the goddess. This is, in effect, the blood connection of the starfire. Gilgamesh, thus, might have been receiving the monoatomic gold equivalent in his status as king, and the one-third god portion gave him extraordinary powers. There are also stories of Inanna in Gilgamesh, in which he apparently refuses her sexual overtures. Inanna's subsequent wrath is understandable, as no woman likes to be turned down, but her initial approach should also be considered noteworthy. After all, if Gilgamesh was running on two-thirds of his godlike cylinders, then he might be a more attractive mate to a goddess who tended to have her way in all things.